Uh, myth number five, terrorism is unrelated to traditional political grievances. Because, again, of the seeming irrationality of the Al-Qaeda-inspired 911 attacks, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that a large number of terrorist attacks involve fairly rational disputes over territory. When we use the GTD to identify the most active terrorist organizations in the world, we find that a large proportion of them involve groups organized around disputes having to do with political control over territory. And I'm not going to go into great detail, but uh, if you just look at our top 20 group list here, and this goes up to 2011, uh, it's, you go through these rapidly and you see how many of them have to do with, they're a group of individuals that want their own homeland, or they, they either want to take over a country as their homeland or take over a section of the country for their homeland. So that hits the Shining Path, the FMLN, the IRA, the FARC, the Taliban, the ETA. I mean, a vast number of these groups are pretty rational in the sense that they're looking for a homeland for themselves. So the dispute involves a fairly easily defined political motive in that regard. Myth number six, most terrorist attacks are incredibly lethal. Again, because of the highly lethal terrorist attack of 911, which by the, by the way is the most lethal uh, attack in our database to this point, it's easy to suppose that most terrorist attacks are incredibly lethal, but what do we get when we look at the data? Well, let's uh, look from uh, 1970 to 2011. 56 percent of our attacks, no fatalities. And you say, how can this be? Well, in the old days in particular, a lot of groups used to warn people before they committed an attack. This was common for the IRA, the Red Brigades, the ETA. Uh, also, a lot of times terrorists mean to kill people, but they fail. They just don't succeed at killing people. So if you end up looking at this, it's actually, I get this broken down 1970 to 2006, and this goes 2007 to 2011. You can see that terrorists are getting deadlier over time. So it, it goes from 56% to 50% of the cases. But still, right around half the cases involve no fatalities. Back in the 19, early 1970s, a terrorism researcher named Ryan Jenkins used to say, terrorists want a lot of people watching, not a lot of people dead. Uh, he sort of revised that re more recently and says that nowadays they seem to want both. But nevertheless, the idea that terrorist attacks often kill people is only about 50% of the time the case. Myth number seven, most terrorist attacks rely on sophisticated weaponry. And you know, the coordinated attacks of 911 uh, involve long-term planning, split-second timing, and a very innovative use of existing res uh, resources. But the sophistication of 911 pales into insignificance compared to the diabolical sophistication of the enemies that Claire Danes, Kiefer Sutherland, Bruce Willis, and other television and media heroes routinely face. Uh, I don't know what Hollywood would do without terrorism when you think about it. So you get these images uh, that encourage us to think that most terrorist strikes depend on uh, the split second timing, sophisticated weaponry, and so on. What do we see when we actually look at the sort of grim reality of terrorism? Well, here's one way you can look at it. What weapons are we getting in terrorist cases? So out of 105,000 cases up to 2011, about 46% involve explosives, bombs, and dynamites. And this is not sophisticated stuff, basically. This is mostly stuff that's pretty readily available, including dynamite. Another 35% firearms, uh, certainly readily available in places like the United States but even uh, fairly readily available in many other parts of the world as well. So if you put these two together, 80% of this, these attacks involve relatively mundane, everyday kinds of weapons. If terrorists had better weapons, they'd probably be able to confront militaries more directly. I mean, terrorism is kind of the, the tool of the underdog. And you see uh, in this other, like 0.46%, this is chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, a tiny, tiny, luckily, a very tiny fraction of all cases. Fortunately for us, sophisticated weapons, including chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, are the rare exception. For the most part, readily available. Myth number eight, most terrorist organizations are long-lasting and difficult to eradicate. And given the per persistence of high-profile, long-lasting groups like Al-Qaeda, the Tamil Tigers, the Irish Republican Army, 
There's a very common perception that most terrorist groups have a long lifespan. We've now identified about 2,300 terrorist groups going back to 1970. One way to gauge their longevity is look at the distance between their first known attack and their last known attack. This is what we get when we do this. We find that uh, almost 70% of groups uh, last for less than a year. In some ways, terrorist organizations are like business startups. They're very likely to go out of business very early on. And this goes down as you get here. Although you do have this interesting group, a little bit over 10% that lasts for 10 or more years. So these are the real heavy hitters out here. But nonetheless, a lot of groups disappear very rapidly. Why do we have the impression that terrorist groups are long-lasting and difficult to eradicate? I think it's because we hear so much about the few groups that are successful, but for every Al-Qaeda and ETA, there are many, many short-lived, relatively unknown groups, such as the anti-capitalist brigades and the revolutionary flames, two groups that appear in our database I'm guessing nobody's ever heard of. In fact, our office has uh, sometimes a holiday party where they come up with uh, 200 terrorist organizations and 200 rock and roll groups. And the idea is to see if you can tell a rock and roll group versus a terrorist organization. And you'd be surprised uh, how difficult that is. <laughs> Myth number nine. Finally, terrorist groups are impervious to governmental counter-terrorist policies and rarely make mistakes. We could call this the myth of the super-terrorist. And again, the advanced planning, the confidence, the destructiveness of 911 contributed to the notion that terrorist groups are infallible. But we have a lot of uh, examples, I think, from research we've been conducting over the last 10 years that I think s suggest otherwise. And I just brought one example with me. We did a study uh, a few years ago that was published subsequently where we looked at the targeting strategies of a group called the Armenian Secret Army for the Liberation of Armenia, or ASALA. It was a very active group based in Turkey. And we were especially interested in this group because of the rapid decline in its activities after about 1981. Uh, and we thought, you know, why would this have happened? So we tried all kinds of explanations, modeling explanations, and the explanation that statistically worked out the best was that Asla made a very historic strategic shift in their targeting strategy in the late and the early 1980s. Before the, before the early 1980s, they were careful to target only Turks, and they avoided non-Turkish, and especially Armenian casualties. So this is an Armenian group that is uh, trying to get a homeland within Turkey. But starting in the early 1980s, they became far less discriminate in their targeting methods. The pivotal historical event happened uh, in an especially brutal attack on Paris's Orly Airport in 1983. An explosive device de detonated prematurely in the terminal area by the Turkish Airlines counter ended up killing eight people and wounding about 50 more. And this increased reliance on random brutal violence, uh, such as the attack on Orly, created a polarized and hostile climate among the supporters of Asla around the world. Um, turns out there was a big Armenian diaspora community in places like Canada and the United States, and they were very turned off by this random violence that wasn't even being aimed at Turks. So this change in targeting strategy was a really bad decision on the part of the, of the leadership and they never recovered from it. They basically disappeared uh, shortly after that. And there are plenty of other examples of this kind of misjudgment and even outright incompetence. And I can't resist going into at least one or two of them. Uh, one of my favorites, less than 90 minutes after detonating a massive truck bomb, in front of the Alfred P. Murray Federal Building in Oklahoma City in 1995, Timothy McVeigh was arrested for driving without a license plate. I mean, you'd think maybe he would have gotten that license plate uh, put together. Similarly, in 1993, a group of Islamic extremists drove a rented bomb-laden van into the underground parking lot of the World Trade Center complex and using a timer set the bomb to detonate. When the bomb exploded, it killed six people and wounded over a thousand more. Remarkably, three hours after the explosion, one of the chief conspirators in the plot, Mohammed Salome, returned to the Ryder Rental Agency in New Jersey to get his deposit for the rented van back. And it gets better. When the rental company refused to return his $400 deposit without a police report, Salome went to the police to report the van stolen. <laughs> so eventually, this, this desperate effort to get his $400 back unraveled the whole conspiracy. And, you know, we have plenty of other examples as well. So my point is, contrary to our stereotypes, 
based on high profile attacks like those in Mumbai, London, Madrid, and New York. Most terrorist attacks for the past four decades have relied on readily available, unsophisticated weaponry, frequently involve few or no fatalities. The typical terrorist group disappears in less than a year. There's ample evidence that terrorists frequently make strategic errors. Attacks were declining just before 911, and very few attacks involved disgruntled groups from one country attacking civilians in another. So, if 911 is a black swan event, why not simply ignore it and go back to business as usual? This might be the advice of American satirist H.L. Mencken, who once famously declared that, quote, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. However, I would argue that the reason why ignoring terrorism is a bad idea is directly related to the second characteristic of terrorism that I've mentioned above, that it tends to be bursty. When it starts to happen, you tend to get a lot of it rapidly. And I just brought a few examples of this, and we have, I think, many with, within our database. This was a study uh, I did with Martha Crenshaw and Su Min Yang a few years ago. We looked at terrorist attacks against the United States, and we used a statistical technique called trajectory analysis, which allows you to group different phenomena into similar categories. And when we did this, we found that the U.S. didn't really have one terrorist group attacking them, but they have sort of three separate waves. They had a group attacking in the 1970s, and then it's in green, and then almost entirely disappeared. Then a group in purple that was very active in the 1980s and then almost completely disappeared. And now a group in red, and I brought this only to 2004, I think this is, but if we had it to the present, this group in red would become a lot bigger, and this is basically the Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda affiliates and Taliban. So in other words, you get this real wave-like characteristic. You get groups that come into existence, do a lot of carnage, and then disappear. They come into existence, do a lot of damage, and disappear. And a number of people have made similar observations. David Rappaport, political scientist, most famously, has talked about the wave-like characteristic of terrorism. But this is a pretty generalized situation. Here, instead, we're looking at aerial hijackings from 1948 to 2007. And you get, again, this real spike in activity in aerial hijacking. We introduced metal detectors here, and I think had a pretty significant impact on uh, aerial hijacking, but a, a kind of burst, again, of hijackings. We see this also with suicide bombings. There were none in the database. They had one in 85, I guess. We started to get a few in the mid-90s, and then huge increase in suicide bombings when it started to look like it was an interesting and useful method. Same with improvised explosive devices. They don't even appear in our data until uh, mid-2002, and then once they appear, we start to get a huge number of them as well. So in a bunch of different areas, we tend to see this uh, burst equality, and some of our researchers at our center have been thinking that perhaps this burst equality of terrorism might give us some insights into how you could predict terrorist attacks in the future. Uh, and there's an interesting analogy here in criminology, in fact, because we have this phenomenon in criminology called near-repeat crime distributions. Have any of you been victimized by burglary? Yes, yeah, so were you worried about getting victimized again after you were a burglary victim? Yeah, that's absolutely right. You should be changing locks, buying a dog, you know, being very vigilant, because once you've been hit by a burglary, you're very likely to get a repeat. However, that repeat decays pretty rapidly. So after, you know, 300, 400 days, you're about normal again. So urban police departments now, in big cities in particular, are developing algorithms so that if you're the victim of a burglary, your chances of another one go up off the charts. But so do your neighbors. Your neighbors' risks go up. So you can actually, you could put a metric on every single house in a community for burglary, and it could fluctuate based on what's really going out there with regard to burglaries. But you get this sort of near-repeat thing. And it turns out that you seem to get this in other areas that are sort of surprising. This is improvised explosive devices in Najaf, Iraq, a province in Iraq, over a period of time. And it looks very much like burglaries. That improvised explosive devices also have this kind of, they repeat like crazy, and then they tail off, so you get a long tail down here. But you have like a really high risk if there's an IED, very good chance that people are going to come back 
and do another IED. And it's even more general than this. I brought just a couple of other examples. This is residential burglaries in the Hollenbeck neighborhood of uh, Los Angeles. You can see you get hot spots, cooler spots. You can see how uh, major freeways play into this. But this is gang shootings in the same neighborhood. And notice um, the hot spots are in somewhat different areas, but you have hot spots. You have hot spots, cool spots. You get this same kind of general distribution. And you even get it in, uh, in very disparate sorts of places. This is from Baghdad in 2007. There's so many ID attacks in Baghdad, you can actually make out the, the main arterial areas in the city. But uh, in, in a way that's somewhat similar to burglaries and other kinds of crimes. So this got us thinking, well, could we use some of the techniques that are being developed in big city police departments to actually predict where a terrorist attack is going to happen, if we know where a terrorist attack has happened in the past? And I'm going to just close with a couple of examples where we've been doing some work. Uh, this has been published now, but I think is kind of interesting along these lines and, and speaks to this notion that terrorism tends to be bursty and that perhaps we can use this bursty nature to counter it to some extent. So we started by uh, using as a test case uh, the Basque separatist group ETA in Spain. And we looked at ETA from 1970 on. Uh, many of you in the room will probably know some, something about ETA. For the last half century, ETA has been one of the deadliest and longest lasting terrorist organizations in the world. It was actually founded as a political movement in 1959 and had as its principal goal to secure a separate homeland for the Basque region. It had its first known fatality in 1968, and its violent attacks on citizens then increased rapidly in the 1970s. Most of the early attacks were aimed at controlling the three central provinces that were seen as the heart of the Basque homeland, the area that ETA hoped to make into a country at some point and to eventually rule. But as the struggle uh, with Spain continued to wear on year after year, Members of ETA began to feel that the strategy of conducting violent attacks in the Basque region was not going to give them the victory that they wanted. And I think this view was strengthened in 1975 when the, with the death of longtime dictator Francisco Franco. So as Spain moved more firmly in the direction of democracy, ETA supporters began to see it as less likely that their localized rebellion would win support of the entire country. So the leadership of ETA signaled a major policy shift in 1978. Uh, and the major policy shift was instead of limiting attacks to the Basque region they, they hoped to control, they'd instead uh, strike more broadly throughout Spain, try to wear down the government until it met their demands. And the great thing about it is they actually made a public announcement to this effect. And you know, one of the things interesting about studying terrorism is if they make, terrorists make public announcements, a lot of the times they're pretty accurate. Uh, one of the ETA leaders says in 1978, the function of the armed struggle is not to destroy the enemy, but to force him through a prolonged psychological and physical attrition to abandon our territory due to exhaustion and isolation. So armed with our newly collected domestic terrorism data on Spain, uh, my colleagues and I tried to determine whether this public announcement could actually be observed and seen with regard to geospatial patterns. So we divided ETA attacks into two periods, before and after the official announcement of policy change in 1978. And lo and behold, uh, they were pretty accurate. You can see most of the attacks before 79 were concentrated in the three Basque regions. There were a few others. This is Madrid, I believe. There are a few others in other parts, but generally lots of concentration in the Basque region. After 1979, they're attacking pretty much throughout the country. At the height of ETA attacks, I think they were hitting something like 45 out of all 50 uh, provinces in Spain. So they were pretty darn accurate, uh, much more widely dispersed. We then began to wonder if we could use geospatial information like this, based on ETA's past behavior, to predict where they would strike next. So, and we're finding that such forecasts, at least in a modest way, are possible. What we did here is we look at the time period of attack, so before and after this statement, and we're using a statistical method called logistical regression here. But we find the negative 0.66 means if you if the it means the chances of the next attack are going to be in the same place, and it means after uh, the second period it's much less likely. They're much more likely, in other words, to attack outside of the Basque region. 
We also found that the longer between attacks, if it's a longer period of time since the last attack, the attack is much less likely to be in the Bass region, more likely to be somewhere else in the country. And we found big regional differences. Attacks in the Basque region, and Navarra is kind of a half Basque, half non-Basque. It would be probably the next uh, part if it were going to be part of the Basque homeland. We found these attacks tend to be repeated in the Basque country. Attacks in Madrid tend to be isolated. If there's an attack in Madrid, it doesn't tend to be followed by another attack in Madrid. So there is a kind of regularity to, to this in a way, even in something that seems as disorganized as terrorism. So this was kind of encouraging because the results, while they're very general, suggest that some of the methods that police use to counter burglaries might be useful responding to something as unusual as terrorism. So we then did a subsequent study, again relying on ETA data, but this time we also examined data from uh, a terrorist group that operated in, Sal in El Salvador, the Farabundi Marti National Liberation Front, or FMLN. The first attacks by the FMLN in our database happened in 1980, and their last attack happened in 1992. Like ETA, the FMLN was interested in controlling territory, but unlike ETA, its main goal was to have power over the entire country. So the uh, ETA wanted to just set up their own homeland within northern Spain. The FMLN wanted to take over the entire country. So in this part of the analysis, we were especially interested in measuring what we call microcycles, which fits into this bursty nature. So in other words, do you get localized bursts of attacks? So we started by classifying all of the attacks from ETA. That was about 2,000 attacks by ETA and 3,300 attacks by the FMLN into a space-time grid like this. So ETA's up here and the FMLN here. So on this axis, we've got uh, whether the next, how far the next attack is away from the last attack. So this is if it happened in the same place. And this is how much time elapsed. So this is less than a week, two weeks, all the way out to more than 20 weeks in both grids. And you can see there's, there's certainly not, it's not random. There are patterns here, but they're all over the place. But what was really interesting was just this tiny grid right up here in both cases. It turns out that a very large proportion of all the cases fit into this very small grid. For ETA, 52% of all attacks happen in microcycles that are within two weeks and five miles of each other. 60% within microcycles that happen within two weeks and 10 miles of each other. And the concentration is even greater for the FMLN. 67% of FMLN attacks were within microcycles of two weeks and five miles and 81% microcycles of two weeks and 10 miles. And we found that compared to other attacks, attacks that happened within these microcycles had very different characteristics, as is shown in the next slide. So for example, assassinations for both ETA and the FMLN, not, they tend to be one-off. They don't tend to be part of microcycles. Bombings, however, are strongly associated with microcycles. So in other words, if you get a bombing, watch out, because you're likely to get another bombing soon and in the same place. Armed assaults, no relationship, but attacks that kill people are, do tend to be repeated. You tend to get more of them fairly soon and in the same place. We also found that there are important geographical differences. Attacks on the national capital tend to be part of microcycles. You tend to get a whole campaign of them. Attacks on the provincial regional capital was only true for ETA but not the FMLN. Which is interesting because, remember, the FMLN is not so interested in the regional capital. They want to take over the whole country, uh, whereas ETA is interested in the regional capital. And defended space is uh, areas where the, the terrorists are most active and have their base of operations. Uh, attacks there tend to be repeated as well. They tend to happen uh, as part of microcycles. So, uh, again, these results are preliminary, but they give us some reason to hope that analysis of the spatial and temporal patterns of terrorism might actually give us a handle on policies aimed at countering it. Which brings me to a few conclusions. I've argued that policies on terrorism are strongly affected by black swan events, like those in 911 Mumbai and London. Unexpected, great magnitude, huge impact on history. But in addition, terrorism has a burst equality. When it's effective in a particular time and place, we tend to get a lot of it rapidly. And this last point suggests to me that it would be foolhardy to ignore the threats posed. 
In fact, in this regard, early events may be a harbinger of things to come. How many of you have seen uh, the classic Hitchcock film, The Birds? I love this uh, example, because I kind of like movies. Those of you who know the, the film, there's this great scene where a single bird lands on the jungle gym equipment behind Melanie Daniels, <coughs> who, who's the rich socialite uh, played by Tippi Hedren. On February 16th, 1993, a truck bomb in the basement parking garage of the World Trade Center killed six people, injured hundreds, and destroyed half a billion dollars worth of property. Looking back at the incident, which happened nearly two decades ago, we can now see that it was a harbinger of things to come, that this group would morph into a worldwide movement that would mount a series of deadly attacks around the globe, and it would be dramatic in terms of Hitchcock. We end up with a very different sort of situation. And just to show you how this has morphed, uh, in 2011, our top 20 groups include, the ones in red are all Al-Qaeda affiliates, arguably, uh, either loosely or, or not so loosely connected to Al-Qaeda. So this attack way back in 1993 actually was a real harbinger of things to come. Okay, uh, let me just wrap up here. Uh, Many commentators, I think, that are interested in terrorism will argue that terrorism has ancient roots. And some people have claimed, for example, that terrorism can be traced back to the first century AD when Jewish zealots in Judea province rebelled, killing prominent collaborators with Roman rule, and other people have other, picked other historical examples, which I think is a very interesting observation. But in fact, I believe that the threat of terrorism is substantially different today than it has been in other periods of human history. And here's why. If you consider that in 1854, London was the most populated city in the world, and Soho was the most densely populated neighborhood in London. And in 1854, Soho had a density of about 400 people per acre. In contrast, on September 11, 2001, the Twin Towers sat on approximately the same amount of land, about an acre. And on a normal day, typical work day, they harbored about 50,000 people each. So in other words, even if Al-Qaeda had existed in 1854, it would have been very difficult for the organization to have taken the lives of nearly 3,000 people in a single coordinated attack. In 1800, about 7% of Americans lived in urban areas. In 2012, more than 80% do. By 2015, there'll be 23 cities in the world that have more than 10 million inhabitants. So this level of urban density has a whole host of benefits but it also provides an unparalleled opportunity for mass destruction of human life. So with enough ammunition to destroy just two buildings, attackers focusing on the World Trade Centers had the potential to take as many lives as all of the losses Americans experienced in the entire 10 years of the Vietnamese War, which is kind of a remarkable thing to think about. You combine this fact with the increasing ability of technology to give smaller and smaller organizations access to increasingly deadly weapons and we have what is likely to be an ongoing global challenge for the foreseeable future. So I would argue that fortunately 911 has turned out to be a rare event, a black swan, but unfortunately the threat of more deadly terrorist attacks is likely to be, I think, a more or less permanent feature of the 21st century. <laughs>